Hi there, I'm Sir Nick, three-time Open champion, and I want to welcome you here to Royal St George's for the 149th Open. Unfortunately, we all know what happened through 2020. The Open was cancelled for the first time since World War II. The RNA golf fans across the world, and myself included, so excited to be back here, ready to go. The Open Championship was first contested in 1860 and then brought here to Royal St George's in 1893. That was the first time it was held outside of Scotland in Sandwich, England. Some of the Open Championships you know from this great course include Harry Varden and Walter Hagen twice, Henry Cotton, Bobby Locke, Sandy Lau, Greg Norman, of course he pipped somebody, and the last winner, Darren Clark. I'm here pre-open week. Things are still being built, but I'm going to take you out on a golf course that I absolutely love. Moons ago, <laughs> I won a PGA here, which was played in May. And then in 1993, I came here and prepared, had it all worked out because I came in the week before with the great Fanny Sunis and my caddy. We practiced here for a week before and it was rock solid. It was silver, the fairways were nearly white. And so I had it all plotted, all planned, exactly how far a ball would run and release into the greens. 30, 40, 50, even 60 yards of bounce, run and trundle to get to the whole location. And of course, Wednesday night, it poured down with rain, so that went out the window. But anyway, I had a, nearly a very good week. That week, of course, won by Greg Norman. And now this July of 2021, very unusually for this time of year, the last two months, it has been raining literally every single day. So the course is magnificent. It is green, it is lush. It will probably dry out. I think the things will change next week. So bottom line, it is prepared absolutely perfectly. But well, we're here on the first tee in this wonderful little amphitheater, but I'm going to take you out on the golf course and show you, you know, some of these wonderful little quirky little features of this great golf course. You know, I'll play some threes and fours and fives, show some really historic bunkers, some wonderful mountains, some elevated greens, and of course, the finish on this golf course is always pretty dramatic and played in good old Lynx style weather. Sunny, breezy, bit of cloud, bit of wind. You may get your hat blown off out here. So if you're looking for some quaintness and cuteness, I'm not just talking about me again. How about this for the starter's hut? Isn't that cool? English thatch roof, that's what they call that. So this is how you get started here at Royal St George's. And if I'd won here in 1993, I'd have one of these in my back garden. The first hole at Royal St George's is a par four, 442 yards. Well, I can't resist. It's a beautiful summer's evening. I'm the only one around here. There it is, the opening hole here of the Open. One of the complaints in the past was with players found very difficult here. Because it's so flat, basically it's a flat golf course, but when they raise the fescue up a good, you know, two feet plus, you lose the fairway almost completely. So I've noticed it's down here at the first, at least, at least to give them half a chance to see some of the edges. But you'll see later on the golf course, I'm going to point this out to you, how you stand there, and it's a horizon of fescue grass. You cannot see the edges. So, and in a baked hot summer, one of the kind of, again, the kind of things the players didn't really enjoy, you could hit it down the right hand side of the fairway and you'd walk down there and you'd find it in the left hand rough. So that used to be, get them a little bit twitched up to start with. So why not? Well, there's nobody around and please don't watch because this is the first swing. I've had six COVID tests to get here. So <laughs> seriously, to be, uh, to be safe and sound and I am. So why not? I'll give one a, a whirl. Wind off the right, so I try and sling it on the wind so I get a little bit of distance out of it. And uh, here we go. Oh, hello. Ah. So maybe that's the secret. Half a dozen COVID tests, about 7,000 miles. I'm here, come and join me. We're gonna have a great time out here. Dying to show you this tee shot. From the back tee here, 491, if the wind's inch you, look what you're aiming at, that little slither. The rough down the right on that hill is like this, so that is a serious tee shot if you have to drive level with the Himalayas. When it goes, turns and goes the other way, they're bombing over the top of it, and it's about 50 yards wide. But I remember in 93, the first two days they played off the back tee, I hit whatever, driving three irons into this hole, I made two threes. Then they put us on the front tee, you know, hit driver nine eyes and I made two fives. So how about work that one out? So that is the kind of a 
a brute. Take all that in, isn't that? Historic bunker, and that is a, that is a seriously tough tee shot. We're putting my design cap on. It was great. I mean, it's fun to do things I haven't done in the past, to run up on top of the Himalayas and have a look. And I just love this fourth hole. I'm going to name it the fish hook because, you know, you come down and look at this turning around. It's pretty unique. That's pretty rare on a Lynx golf course. You know, a lot of Lynx holes runs pretty straight. Your dog leg right and left, that sort of thing. But to have one this twisting fairway, you've got options and playing across that. And as you can see, we're, we're 35, 40 feet up, and that's the only way you can see the green. So as I described earlier on, no view from down there, but I just love that. I think I'll, uh, I'll do a Faldo version of this somewhere one day. Well, welcome to one of the few named bunkers in England. As you know, many of them are named up in Scotland. You've got Hellbunker and Strath and all sorts of things, the coffins. And this fella <laughs> was created in um, 1887, now called the, the Himalayas, because, I mean, look at the size of it, all natural. We've got a big mound there, another one behind there. It's a little off the fourth fairway, a little. I think a little for these professionals, maybe you get a hard left right wing. We hope for that, that they would, you know, they would miss it right. Highly unlikely the professional of, of today will end up, they'd be, actually be really happy to end up because look at this. After two months of rain, it is brutal. So it looks big, but wait you see when you get in the darn thing. It's, that must be good, what, 40 plus feet high? Actually down here, there's even an echo, echo, echo when you chat, chat, chat. So anyway, I'm going to attempt to try and loft one <laughs> over that. <laughs> and I've wisely taken uh, my 58 degree. And I guess it's the same rules. You better hit down to get the thing to go up. Whoa, only just safely out, but many haven't got out of here safely. Some great stories. I'll have to check a few of them out. So if it's into the wind, this is 270 yards from the back tee, which is kind of all level with the Himalayas on the right. So all those mounds, all that rough is in play. And if you even look left, if you were to bust one and, and get it to run, you've got a nasty little bunk. And then look at that. That's your view or little of it. There's the green, still 220 yards to go from here into the wind. You imagine what that looks so. Humps and bumps, bunkers all the way, and then the green is angled. All sorts going on, but I thought, I just wanted to show you, this is what the players see. Imagine that, starting of your round. That's a pretty tough second shot, isn't it? So I've moved up 70 yards. If this is downwind, they'll take it right over the top of the Himalayas. It won't be in play. Here's your 350 yard drive right here, and you can see, it's so much better, isn't it? What a great view. <laughs> you can't see a thing. So you might have a nine iron wedge in your hand downwind. And so that's the importance of knowing your yardage is, where to land it, how it's going to release, because visually you've got nothing. You've heard me talk about the knife edge between the good and the bad shot. Check this out. <laughs> so one will head back down the front. That and one will end up nice and close to a potential hole location. Give you some idea of the slope of this green. Isn't that amazing? Well, I wanted to show you this pretty unique, amazing par four, you know, a real difference, isn't it, between the tee shot into the wind and then the one downwind, and then how about this for a green? <laughs> now on the sixth tee, the second of the par threes, nice medium length, 174 yards. Nice big green. I know, I know it's a big green, but visually look what you can see or not see again. This is the, the characteristic of this golf course. So my little lesson here is matching club selection with shot shape. So really important because when you've got a cross breeze, you can use it either to bank the ball to shorten it or you can turn it on the wind to lengthen the shot. So depending on hole location, you know, if 175 to the middle of the green, you think, well, that's a stock six iron for me. Yeah, but, and you see a yardage of 160, you, so you may think, oh, I'll just go a club less, but all you've got to do is work the ball against the breeze, and I can promise you, it's easy to take off 15 yards, get it to 160. So if I had a 160 pin, I could still go with a six, 
and hit a fade against it, and that's how I get that yardage. If the flag was at the back of the green, past the 175, 180 plus, say, I know I could turn it on the wind a touch and get it to release, and then I hopefully get up to 180. So that gives you some idea how one club with the right shot can almost cover 20 yards on the green. That's really important to know because you get either of those wrong, you pick a club and hit the wrong shot shape, you can either come up too short or too long. So I'm going to hit both of those two shots. I'll hit a six iron, I'll fade one against the wind, that should hopefully go on the front of the green somewhere, and I'll turn one a little bit on the wind and get a bit of release and hopefully get past the middle line. Right, here we go, big. This is the draw. This is the swoopy draw, get it down the right side. So there you go, at least 20 yards difference between the cut against the wind and the draw into the middle of the green. Now let's go up and hit a putt on this green and I want to tell you an old visualization story from a few moons ago. So the amazing thing about shot selection is how it fits the green as well. So on a right to left wind, if I came in with a draw to this front section, I've completely forgotten about how it's actually half hidden from the tee. So if this comes in a draw with a kick, I'm off down there. So that's why a fade would suit to come in here. So that was the faded six, dug in onto this little upslope, and I managed to have a really nice low draw and got it to land somewhere here. I think this might be my spot right there and fed into the middle of the green. And of course, there's even a back section. So this is quite a monstrous par three grids, three main areas. But there's a clue that working different shaped shots into the right areas gets this blooming thing to sit down where you want it to. Well, you hear me harping on about visualization and the real power of it. I want to tell you a story. When I was on this green, the sixth green here at Royal St. George's, I used that power of his right, because I had this putt, something like this. I remember across the green, 20 odd feet, and I looked and I had a sea of fans all across the hill, fantastic. So I was thinking to myself, well, if I knock this one in, they're gonna go nuts. And for a split second, I don't know why, I, th I thought, so how am I gonna react? What am I gonna do if they're going nuts? What? And so mentally I rehearsed it. I thought, well, if I hold this, they react, I'm gonna go like that. So isn't that funny how I put all of that together? That was what I saw, that's what I visualized. And guess what? I stood up to the putt, hit it, and it was yes! <laughs> so, power of visualization, try it. Well, if you're looking for challenging, <laughs> welcome to the 10th team of the Open, Royal St. George's. There it is, my goodness, and we're into the wind. We've got the southerly wind now. This is probably what the players will face. It's picking up. It's about mm, 15 miles an hour plus. And we've got a wall of fescue to get over, but we've got to drive it low. So I'm going to give you a couple of driving tips, how to keep the golf ball down, get some, the right flight on it. You know, I would choose the bunker down the left for me, yeah, that's right in play, 230, play well, it's 240 to the back of it, <laughs> into the wind that's playing 60 plus. So right now, the, the pros this week will probably have to take it over. They have choices, either fade it or, or draw it. Um, I have to go down the right and try and work it low. So let me give you a couple of simple tips. So what are we trying to do to keep the ball down? We've got to get level through it. We've got to get the club moving. Anytime the club is coming down, we're putting backspin on it and we're going to send it up. So a couple of little tips. Number one, how high would you tee the ball? Because depending on your skill level, sometimes putting it down low, because you think I'll, I'll tee it low, makes you hit little down on it and you still pop it up. But again, that's your skill level. So sometimes try it, tee the ball a smidgen too high because it's going to really force you to stay up and stay level on it. If you could do that, it's a, it's a great training aid. Maybe you can't do it on the golf course, but on the practice ground, great first little tip. So number two, take your almost your normal address pursuit and swap your hands around, grip it left-handed, just for a split second, because it gets my right shoulder up. I don't want this fella here, because automatically I'm looking up to the sky. I want to get this right shoulder high enough so I feel like I'm keeping the ball down. So simple as that. Grip it left-handed, now feel where that right shoulder is and can you swap your hands and keep your right shoulder in a very similar position. So that's quite a, a good one. So next it's going to be the same, same backswing and everything. 
but again we don't want to lean into it and go down on it because we get too steep sends up so can you do the opposite can you feel like you go down and can you feel like you actually grow on it if you feel like you can get an inch half an inch coming up you see what's happening with the club head it's getting down nice and low nice and level all the way through and of course through it we've got to keep going you can't give in you can't hit at it and give up on it you'll send it every so it's got to have the image almost like you're bowling the ball you've got to go low through and i just love we've got two foot high fescue off the end of the tee <laughs> just in case we hit it too low so let's try and put all those together i'll do the little trick grip it there get my right shoulder as high as possible i'm going to aim down the right hand side and i'm going to grow on it i'm going to feel like i get a little taller as i get through it So that one worked. How about that? From the fairway, we have an aerial view. There's the player's view, slightly uphill. As we climb up, we'll give you some idea of the elevation of this green, how it falls off steeply down the left-hand side and over the back. We we'll zoom in on the contours of the green. You can see how steep they are on that front left corner. That's why it gathers and sends it off the front of the green. All red areas are dangerous unpinnable hole location you see just a central area so let's have a little 360 around the green to give you a clue how how much drop off there is especially over the back that is an absolute no-no so you've got to get into the back section for safety and two wonderful bunkers down the right hand side the one by the green very playable and the one short of the green to the right is an absolute brute you know you've seen some of it st andrews up to 12 feet deep and this is one of the deepest on the golf course. And it's a work of art, isn't it, to make it look like that. So give you a couple of tips. The sand is very different here. This sand was newly put in, I believe, 10,000 years ago. <laughs> this is El Natural. So it has this, again, it has a wonderful sound to it. When you whack the sand, listen to that. You get that lovely thump. So that's very important. And then when you get a revetted face close to the ball, simple rule of thumb, if you are out just about outside a club length from the face you can get it out if you're if you're inside that you have got to look for other what options going you know sideways so it's a great feeling is if i had a handful of sand and i'm trying to get it out of the bunker if i if i threw my hand against too far forward too low look what happens so i've got to set myself up to give myself a chance to throw it out as simple as that so that's what we do that's how you set up open the face as much as you can so it's pointing a good couple of yards to the right even sometimes you put your left wrist way back right over your right knee like so to get even add even more loft and then we, again the same old rules you're trying to strike it somewhere inside your left heel there open and as i said i'm leaning back to so double check that feeling as you go through that's the most important thing and then stay there Keep your eye on the back of the ball. And this sand, I can promise you, you've got to really whack it and go for it. So it's a lot of right hand. You want to get that club head moving as fast as you can. Remember, dear old Gary Player's tip. Imagine you're striking the match down there and give it a thump. There you go. Got to be aggressive out these bunkers. Set up really well and give it a really good thump. Fourteenth hole, par five, maybe an opportunity to make a birdie or something like that, but also, oh my goodness, opportunity for a disaster here because, you know, the players are going to have to aim on this wind, the southerly wind. There is your view. So the, the left edge of the fairway is somewhere between that little hut there and that very small bunker. So somewhere in there. So on this wind, what makes it so really difficult is you've got to start it out there, nail it on that left to right wind, the worst wind for a pro. The natural drawers will try, maybe try and send one down and, and turn it back into the wind. But you can imagine when the ball's turning back into that, it's like hitting the wind wall. And if anything is over pulled into the deep, thick rough down the left, good luck finding it for starters. And then everything kind of snowballs. Then you're going to have to think about laying up short of the canal across the fairway. Even if you're going for this in two, 
you know, there's a lot going on. We've got, if you remember moons ago, Dustin Johnson blocked one way right, cost him the open. So when you're looking for wind direction in America, a simple tip is you look at the ponds or the lakes to see the ripples, which way they're coming. That gives you a very good clue. On a British Isles Lynx golf course, you look for the trees. There are no trees out here. So of course you throw up some grass like so, and anything like that. So that's how you get the wind direction over here. Here we are, pre-open week, a lot of construction going on. Obviously the green staff busy working away. Here we are at the start of the landing area at the 14th fairway, par five. Nothing could be easier. Look, dead flat fairway, ha. OB right there, just yards, a yard or two off the fairway. What I do want you to come and see is come and see the left rut. So from the tee, you cannot see this left hand cut. So tee back there, we've got this little hut here down. So obviously anything right at the hut is great. Pull one left a little bit, it comes in a bit of an angle, gone. Look at that, come and have a look. So there's your strategy. Doesn't matter how strong you are, you'd have be chopping that back out short of the canal. The canal's 320, so with a different wind, guys can get down there. But if you're playing a bit of safety and you pull it a touch, this is where you're gonna end up and then you knock it out and keep going from there. So let's go check out the famous canal. So if we've hit a great tee shot, 300, 320 into the canal, still got 221 and on a wind like this, I don't know if they could actually could get it this far. So if you're playing a three shot, you've got options of going left, keeping it left, but you're pretty sure the flag will be left. Or do you try and get to the right hand side, bringing out of bounds into play? So even though it's wide, you still got to get it in the right section. So even trying to reach the green here of 221 in a cross breeze is playing at least 230 to the front. I mean, I know you, even if these guys are trying to hit a three iron or something like that against the breeze, I mean, good luck in turning it perfectly. You overturn it and you're in the bunkers left. Or if it doesn't happen, out of bounds is right there on that right hand side. So uh, as I said earlier on, even though it's a five, everybody says, oh, a chance to pick up a shot. It is trouble left, right and center on this one. So a little bit of 101 strategy. Sometimes it's good to get to the green and then turn around and look back at the hole and think, how do I want to play this, this hole? Especially if I'm going to lay up. Remember the two bunkers were in the middle of the fairway there. Because even though it's 50 yards wide of fairway, if I went down that left-hand side, I laid up there to this left-hand pin on this left to right wind, I've suddenly made things really difficult. Plus, if I caught the down slope, it would end up off that side of the green. So that's when it will make sense for anything down the left hand side of the green. You try to get as far to the right as possible, then you're coming up that little plateau there. So that's why it's kind of really important to really plot your way and know exactly when you see the hole location to start the hole, how you're going to plot your way down the hole. A wild looking 16th hole, par three, just 162 yards. It looks innocuous, doesn't it? Not sure Thomas Bjorn would agree with that. Short par three, but straight into the wind. So this is one of the shots I developed way back from Muirfield, and he heard me talk about this, the soft arms, where you literally let them collapse. Or a great image is imagine you're playing from back in the 1800s in a lovely old tweed coat. So the, the arms are gonna kind of break a little bit here. You collect the golf ball and you have a lovely little old school Harry Varden finish, something like that. So I'm gonna hit one normal, straight into the wind. I'm in the bunker right of 16 here, and unfortunately, like the road hole bunker, there's been some disasters. If you remember, Thomas Bion in the Open 2003 was right there with a chance. I have to give him a credit. Back then, the sand was super soft that week and very deep, been packed by all the rain, so it's far easier. But just to give you some idea how difficult this can be, you, you lob it out, trying to get it to the top of the hill. It doesn't quite make it, and this is what you get for your your sins. The hardest shot in golf is having another go at the same shot when you've just seen failure. So uh, anyway, I thought I'd give you some idea of uh, how tricky things can be. 18th tee, Sunday afternoon, four to win the Open. <laughs> how would that feel? Number one, pretty good. You've obviously played well, really well for the last 71 holes. Then you've got this really challenging tee shot. They've added a couple more bunkers down the left-hand side. 
Well, let's swoop down and have a look at the true character of this 18th hole and the landing area. And it is quite incredible. It doesn't look that much of a mound or a hump in the middle of the ferry from the tee, but as we as we swing down and look at the contours, you'll see that left of center, it will kick sharply left and definitely end up in the left-hand rough. Any, anything coming in with a hook will end up probably deep in the rough. And then this wonderful little kick, again, it feeds off to the right, so that's the absolute ideal spot to end up right of center. Obviously, the longer hitters will probably get a down slope and could end up threatening the bunker further down, but it gives you some indication that really even though it, it's 45 yards wide there is only about 15 to 20 yards of flat fairway to keep the ball in play. But I reckon we're going to see plenty in the left rough and right rough so I'll give it a go off the tee first and like that. Get it on the ground as quick as possible I think is the order of the day. So that's pretty good, but I reckon uh, under pressure we're going to see plenty in the right rough and in the left rough, so let's go and have a look. So even though the 18 fairway is pretty close to 45 yards wide, you can see from my first tee shot how it gathers and sends it down the right, so that's pretty safe. And anything pulled a little left, look what happens if that comes in with a bit of pace. That is off the fairway. And right now it's green, so boy, would you take that, but if things firm up and it makes it into the the hay, or you've pulled it straight into the hay, that left-hand hay is impossible. That You'll do well just to get it over this bunker in front of you and somewhere up there for safety. So let's go and have a look at the right rough to see if it's playable. In your practice round preparation, really important to make a note of which side of the fairways you can miss and still get half a shot. As we saw, left rough or the hay, no chance. So if you were going to miss this fairway, you would chance yourself, well, I might get it fortunate enough to get a lie. So I've thrown one in here just to show you how to, as we haven't hit a rough shot today. So I'm going to play a good old thump and run, as I call it, try and, you know, be sensible. You know, you look at a lie like this, can you get eight or seven irons onto it? I've got about a hundred 60 to 170 to the middle of this green. Most important thing is I want to get it out of here onto the ground and release it towards the green. I mean that would be the, the smartest play and you have to kind of get a little bit of a little bit of guesswork of, of how it's going to react to come out of there. It's going to come out I would have thought pretty slow, it's pretty deep so I've gone with a seven. It, I won't get a lot of carry so except you want to try and get it on the ground and if you've got the room to run it in there use it so gonna get that right shoulder really high and thump down and give it a bit of a give it a bit of the old chicken wing at least it came out and it's gonna release and with a bit of that that will run somewhere towards the front of the green second shot here into 18 again to give you a wonderful 360 and we've we come down to the left hand side of the green where Sandy Lyle ball came off the edge and he chipped it up back up and it came back down to his feet. It's almost like the sandwich or the English version of the Valley of Sin is a lot steeper than one might imagine and we're going to swing back and give you some contoured lines and you wait to see the heat map. It's really quite amazing how few areas we've got that are pinnable. It's really quite amazing how it falls off so steeply down that left-hand side. It's receptive. Thank you for joining me here at Royal St George's. I'm sure they're going to have a fantastic championship and who will be crowned the champion golfer at the end of the week. Let's wait and see. But for more information of the 150th Open at St Andrews, the ballot for tickets is open from the RNA, the members and all the volunteers. I know you're going to enjoy the upcoming Open from here, Royal St George's.